Promised Land, Chapter 8. Entering the summer of 2008, our campaign's first order of business was to find the Democratic Party. The prolonged and bruising primary had left hard feelings between Hillary's staff and mine, and some of her ardent boosters threatened to withhold their support unless I put her on the ticket. But despite speculation in the press of a possibly irreparable breach, our first most primary meeting, held in early June at the Washington home of our colleague Senator Diane Feinstein, proved to be courteous and businesslike, if not without tension. At the outset, Hillary felt obliged to get a few things off her chest, mainly having to do with what she considered unfair attacks by my campaign. As the winner, I felt obliged to keep my own complaints to myself. But it didn't take long to clear the air. The bottom line, she said, was that she wanted to be a team player for the good of the Democratic Party and for the good of the country. It may have helped that she sensed my sincere admiration. Although I would ultimately decide that having her as a running mate posed too many complications, including the awkwardness of a former president roaming the West Wing without a clear portfolio, I was already considering a different role for her in the Obama administration. How Hillary felt about me, I couldn't say, but she, if she harbored any doubts about my readiness for the job ahead, she kept them to herself. From our first public appearance together a few weeks later, in a small New Hampshire town called Unity, Connie but effective, until the very end of the campaign, both she and Bill did everything we asked of them with energy and a smile. With Hillary on board, the team and I got busy designing our broader electoral strategy. Like the primaries and caucuses, a presidential general election resembles a big mad puzzle. Which combination of states do you need to win to get the requisite to 70 electoral votes? For at least 20 years, nominees of both parties had come up with the same answer, assuming that the majority of states were inalterably Republican or Democratic, and therefore concentrating all their time and money on a handful of big battleground states like Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Plouffe had a different idea. One happy byproduct of her interminable primary was that we had campaigned in every nook and corner of the country. We had battle-tested volunteers in a number of states Democrats had historically ignored. Why not use that advantage to complete in traditional Republican-leaning territory? Based on the data, Proof was convinced we could win western states like Colorado and Nevada. With a big boost in turnout among minority and younger voters, he believed we even had a chance in North Carolina, a state that hadn't gone Democratic in a presidential election since Jimmy Carter in 1976, and Virginia, which hadn't gone Democratic since Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Broadening the electoral map would give us multiple paths to victory, Plouf argued, and would also help down ballot Democratic candidates. At a minimum, it would force John McCain and the Republican Party to spend resources shoring up their vulnerable flanks. Among the various Republicans who had competed for the presidential nomination, I had always considered John McCain to be most worthy of the prize. I had admired him for a far being before I got to Washington, not only for his service as a Navy pilot and the unimaginable courage he had shown during five and a half harrowing years as a POW, but because of the contrarian sensibility and willingness to back Republican Party orthodoxy on issues like immigration and climate change that he had shown in his 2000 pre presidential campaign. While we were never close to in the Senate, I often found him insightful and self-depreciating, quick to punch up pretension and hypocrisy on both sides of the aisle. McCain did enjoy b being something of a press corps darling. My constituency, he once called them, never passing up a chance to be on the Sunday morning news shows, and among his colleagues he had a well-earned reputation for volatility, quick to explode over small disagreements his pallid face reddening, his ready voice rising at the first sign of a perceived slight. But he wasn't an ideologue. He respected not only the customs of the Senate, but also the institutions of our government and democracy. I never saw him display the race change nativism that regularly infected other Republican politicians. And on more than one occasion, I'd seen him display real political courage. Once as the two of us stood in the well of the Senate waiting for a vote, John had confided to me that he couldn't stand a lot of 
the craziest in his own party. I knew this was part of his shtick, privately playing to Democrats' sensibilities while voting to his caucus about 90% of the time. But the disdain he expressed for the far right wing of his party wasn't an act, and in an increasingly paralyzed climate, the political equivalent of a holy war, McCain's modern, modest heresies, his unwillingness to profess the true faith, carried a real cost. The crazies in his party mistrusted him, they considered him a RINO, Republican in name only, and he was regularly attacked by the Rush Lindbergh crowd. Unfortunately for McCain, it was precisely these voices of the hard right that were exciting the core GOP voters most likely to vote in presidential primaries. Rather than the business-friendly, strong on defense, socially moderate Republicans McCain appealed to and was most comfortable with. And as the Republican primary wore on and McCain sought to win over some of the very people he professed to despise, as he abandoned any pretense or fiscal rectitude in favor of even bigger tax cuts, than the Bush tax cuts he had once voted against and hedged his position on the climate change to accommodate fossil fuel interests. I sensed a change taking place in him. He seemed pained, uncertain, that once jaunty irre- irreverent warrior transformed into a cranky Washington insider, lassoed to an incumbent president with an approval rating around 30% and a hugely unpopular war. I wasn't sure I could beat the 2000 version of John McCain, but I was increasingly confident that I could beat the McCain of 2008. That's not to say I thought the race would be easy. In a contest against American hero, the election wouldn't be decided on issues alone. Indeed, we suspected that the central question was likely to be whether a majority of voters could get comfortable with the idea of a young, inexperienced American African senator, one who hadn't previously served in the military or even an executive office, filling the role of commander-in-chief. I knew that if I was to earn the Americans' trust on this front, I needed to speak from the most informed position possible, especially about the nation's role in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is why, just a few weeks after I had wrapped up the nomination, we decided I would embark on nine days of foreign travel. The proposed schedule was brutal. In addition to a brief stop in Kuwait and three days on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq, I will meet the leaders of Israel, Jordan, the United Kingdom and France and deliver a major foreign policy address in Berlin. If we pull the trip off, we would not only dispel concerns voters might have about my ability to operate effectively on the world stage, but also highlight at a time when voters are deeply troubled by the strained alliances of the Bush years just what a new era of American leadership might look like. Of course, with the political press sure to fly spec my every move, there was a good chance something might go wrong. Even a single blunder might reinforce the notion that I wasn't ready for prime time and tank our campaign. My team figured it was worth the risk. Plouffe was a tightrope without a net. Plouffe said, That's when we are at our best. I pointed out that it was me and not we perilously up in the air. Nevertheless, I left Washington in good spirits, eager to travel overseas after a year and a half with my nose to the campaign grindstone. Joining me on the Afghanistan and Iraq legs of the trip were two of my favorite colleagues, both of whom are seasoned in foreign policy. Chuck Hagel, the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Jack Reed, who sat at the Armed Service Committee. In personality, the two men couldn't have been more different. Jack, a liberal democrat from Rhode Island, was slightly built, studious, and understated. A proud West Point graduate, he had been one of a few senators to vote against authorizing the Iraq war. Chuck, a conservative Republican from Nebraska, was a broad-shouldered, expansive, and full of good humor. A Vietnam veteran with two purple hearts, he had voted for the Iraq war. What the two shared was an abiding reverence for the U.S. military and a belief in the prudent use of the American power. After almost six years, their views on Iraq had converged, and they were now two of the world's most incisive and credible critics. Their bipartisan presence on the trip helped deflect any criticism that it was a campaign stunt, and Chuck's willingness not only to travel with me, but also to publicly praise aspects of my foreign policy 
just four months before the election, was a bold and generous gesture. On a Saturday in mid-July, we landed at Bagram Air Base, a six square mile installation north of Kabul, set as against the jagged peaks of the Hindu Kush that served as the largest U.S. military base in Afghanistan. The news wasn't good. The collapse of Iraq into sectarian, sectarian violence and the Bush administration's decision to reinforce our presence with a sustained troop surge had siphoned military and intelligence capabilities out of Afghanistan. By 2008, we had five times as many troops in Iraq as we had there. The shift in focus had allowed the Taliban, the Sunni Islamic insurgents we had been fighting since 2001, to go on the offensive, and that summer, the monthly U.S. casualties in Afghanistan would exceed those in Iraq. As usual, our military was doing all it could to make a tough situation work. The newly assigned commander of coalition force, General Dave McEan, arranged for his team to brief us on the set steps they were taking to push back against Taliban strongholds. The following day, dining in the mess hall at the U.S. coalition headquarters in Kabul, we listened as a group of soldiers spoke of their mission with enthusiasm and pride. Hearing these honest young men and women, most of them just a few years out of high school, talk about building roads, training Afghan soldiers and setting up schools, only to see their work periodically interrupted or undone because they were understaffed or under-resourced, was both humbling and frustrating. I vowed that given the chance, I would get them more help. That night, we slept at the heavily fortified U.S. Embassy, and in the morning, we drove to the imposing 90th century palace where President Hamid Karzai lived. In the 1970s, Kabul had been not so different from the capitals of other developing countries, rugged, around the edge but peaceful and growing, full of elegant hotels, rock music and college students intent on modernizing their country. Karzai and his ministers were product of that era, but many had fled to Europe or the United States either during the Soviet invasion that began 1979 or when the Taliban took over in the mid-1990s. After it as its assault on Kabul, the United States had brought Karzai and his advisors back and installed them in power. Functional expatriates we hoped would serve as the Afghan face of a new non-militant order. With the impeccable English and stylish dress, they fit the part, and as our delegation dined on a banquet of traditional Afghan fare, they did their best to persuade us that a modern, tolerant, and self-sufficient Afghanistan was within reach so long as American troops and cash continued to flow. I might have believed Karzai's word, were it not for the report of rampant co corruption and mismanagement within his government. Much of the Afghan countryside was beyond the control of Kazbul, and Karzai rarely ventured out, reliant not just on U.S. forces but on Apache work of alliances with local war warlords to maintain what power he possessed. I thought about his seeming isolation later that day as a pack of Black Hawk air helicopters flew us over mountainous terrain on our way to a U.S. forward operation base, FOB, near Helmand on Afghanistan's south southern plateau. The small villages of mud and wood that we saw from the air blended seamlessly into the dark colored rock formation with barely a paved road or an electric line in sight. I tried to imagine what the people below thought of the Americans in their midst, or their own president in his sumptuous palace, or even the idea of a nation state called Afghanistan. Not much, I suspected. They were just trying to survive. Buffet, buffeted by forces as constant and unpredictable as the winds, and I wondered what it might take beyond the courage and the skill of our troops, despite the best laid plans of analysts in Washington, to reconcile Americans' idea of what Afghanistan should be with a landscape that for hundreds of years had proven impoverished to change. Such thoughts stayed with me as we left Afghanistan and headed to Iraq. Spending a night in Kuwait along the way, trends had improved since my last visit to, to Iraq. 
a surge in US troops, the internationally certified election of Shite Prime Minister Nur Kamal al Malik, and a brokered agreement with Sunni tribal leaders in the western province of Anbar had reversed some of the sec- sectarians carnage unleashed by the original u.s invasion and subsequent bungling by men like donald Rumsfeld and paul bremer john mckean interpreted the recent success to mean we were winning the fight and would continue to so long as we stayed the course and in what had become a common nostrum among the republicans listen to our leaders on the ground I drew a different conclusion. After five years of heavy U.S. involvement with Saddam Hussein gone, no evidence of WMDS and a democratically elected government installed, I believe faced withdrawal was in concern, in order. One that would build in the time we needed to stand up Iraq's security forces and root out the last vestiges of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Guarantee ongoing military intelligence and financial support and be beginning bringing our troops home so that we could hand iraq back to its people as in afghanistan we had a chance to mingle with troops and visit fob in anba before meeting with prime minister Min- Mi- malik he was a duo figure vaguely nixonian with his long face heavy five o'clock shadow and indirect gaze he had a cause to be stressed, for his new job was both difficult and dangerous. He was trying to balance the demands of the domestic Shite power blocks that had elected him and the Sunni population that had dominated the country under Saddam. He also had to manage countervailing pressures from the US benefactors and Iranian neighbors. Indeed, Malik stays to Iran, where he had lived in exile for many years, as well as his uneasy alliance with certain Shite militia made him and them to Saudi Arabia and other U.S. allies in the Persian Gulf regions, underscoring just how much the U.S. invasion had strengthened Iran's strategic position there. Whether anyone in the Bush White House had discussed such a predictable consequence before ordering U.S. troops into Iraq was uncertain, but the administration sure wasn't happy about it. My conversations with several high-ranking generals and diplomats made clear that the White House interest in maintaining a sizable troop presence in Iraq was about more than a simple desire to ensure stability and reduce violence. It also was about preventing Iraq from taking further advantage of the mess we'd made. Given that the issue was dominating the foreign policy debate both in Congress and in the campaign, I asked Malik through the interpreter whether he thought Iraq was ready for withdrawal of US troops. We were all surprised by his unequivocal response, though he expressed deep appreciation for the efforts of US and British forces and hoped that America would continue to help pay for the training and maintenance of Iraq forces. He agreed with me that we set a time frame for a US withdrawal. It was unclear that what was behind Malik's decision to push an accelerated timetable for US withdrawal, simple nationalism pro-Iranian sympathies, a move to consolidate his power. But as far as the political debate in the U.S. state was concerned, Malik's position had big implications. It was one thing for the White House or John McCain to dismiss, dismiss my calls, but in table for withdrawal as weak and irresponsible, a version of cut and run, it was quite another to dismiss the same idea coming from Iraq's newly elected leader. Of course, at the time, Malik still didn't really call the shots in his country. The commander of coalition forces in Iraq, General David Petraeus, did, and it was my conversation with him that foreshadowed some of the central foreign policy debates I'd have for much of the presidency. Trim and fit. With a PhD in international relations and economics from Princeton and an orderly analytic mind, Petraeus was considered the brains behind our improved position in Iraq and the individual to whom the White House had essentially contracted out strategy we took our helicopter together from the Baghdad airport to the heavy fortified green zone talking all the way 
and although the substance of our conversation wouldn't appear in any press write-ups as far as my campaign team was concerned that was just fine it was the photographs they cared about images of me seated next to a foster general about a board and a black hawk helicopter wearing a headset and an aviator glass apparently it proved youthful vigorous contrast to an unfortunate depiction of my republican opponent that had happened to surface on the same day McCain riding shotgun on a golf cart with former president george w bush the two of them resembling a couple of pastel sweated grandpas on their way to country club picnic meanwhile sitting together in his spacious office at a coalition headquarters patrols and i discussed everything from the need for an arabic language specialist in the military to the vital role of development projects would play in delegitimizing de- militia and territorial organization and bolstering the new government bush deserved credit i thought for having selected this particular general to write what had been a sinking ship if we had unlimited time and resources if america's long-term national security interests absolutely dependent on creating a functioning democratic state allied to the u.s in iraq then petrol's approach had as good a chance as any of achieving the goal but did not have unlimited time or resources when you boiled it down that's what the argument over withdrawal was all about how much did we continue to give and when would it be enough as far as i was concerned we were approaching that line our national security required a stable iraq but not a showcase for american national building patrols on the other hand believed that without a more sustained u.s investment whatever gains we'd made we are still easily reversed i asked how long it would take for them to feel permanent two years five or ten he couldn't say but announcing a fixed intent ball for withdrawal he believed would only give the enemy the chance to eat us out but wouldn't that always be true he considered the point and what about surveys indicating that a strong majority of iraq's both shit and sunny had wearied of the occupation and wanted us out sooner than rather than later that was a problem we would have to manage he said the conversations were cordial and i couldn't blame petrels for wanting to finish the mission if I were in your shoes, I told him, I'd want the same thing. But a president's job required looking at a bigger picture. I said, just as he himself had to consider trade-offs and constraints that officers under his command did not. As a nation, how should we weigh additional two or three years in Iraq at a cost of nearly $10 billion a month against the need to dismantle Osama bin Laden and core Al-Qaeda operations in northwestern Pakistan? Or against the schools and roads not built back home? Or the erosion of readiness should another crisis arise? Or the human toll exalted on our troops and their families? General Patrels nodded politely and said he looked forward to seeing me after the election. As our delegation took its leave that day, I doubted I had persuaded him on the wisdom of my position any more than he had persuaded me. Was I prepared to be a world leader? Did I have the diplomatic skills and knowledge and stamina, the authority to command, the balance of the trip was designed to answer such questions, an elaborate tradition on the international stage. There were bilateral meetings with King Abdullah in Jordan, Gordon Brown in England, Nicolas Sarkozy in France. I met with Angela Merkel in Germany, where I also spoke to an audience of 200,000 people gathered in front of Berlin's historic victory column declaring that just as an early generation had torn down the wall that once divided Europe, it was now our job to, to tear down the other, less visible walls, between rich and poor, between races and tribes, between natives and immigrants, between Christians, Muslims and Jews. Over a couple of marathon days in Israel and West Bank, I met separately with Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, and did my best to understand not only the logic but also the emotions behind the ancient and seemingly intractable conflict. In the south town of Sedot, I listened as parents described the terror of rocket shells launched from nearby Gaza, landing just a few yards from their children's bedrooms. 
In Ramallah, I heard Palestinian speak of the daily humiliations endured at Israeli security checkpoints. According to Gibbs, the US press thought I had passed the looking presidential test with flying colors, but for me, the trip went beyond mere optics. Even more than back home, I felt the immensity of the challenges that awaited me if I won, the grace I'd need to do the job. These thoughts were on my mind the morning of July 24, when I arrived at the Western Wall in Jerusalem, built 2,000 years ago to protect the sacred Temple Mount, and viewed as a gateway to divinity and a place where God accepted the prayers of all who visit. For centuries, pilgrims from around the world had made a custom of committing their prayers to paper and stuffing them into the cracks of the wall. So before coming that morning, I had written my own paper on a piece of hotel stationery. In the grey light of dawn, surrounded by my Israeli hosts, aides, secret service agents, and the clutter of media cameras, I bowed my head before the wall as a bearded rabbi read a psalm calling for peace in the holy city of Jerusalem. As was the custom, I laid a hand on the soft limestone, stealing myself in silent contemplation, and then wadded up my piece of paper and pushed it deep into a crevice in the, the wall. Lord, I had written, protect my family and me, forgive me my sins, and help me guard against pride and despair. Give me the wisdom to do what is right and just, and make me an instrument of your will. I had assumed those words were between me and God, but the next day they showed up in an Israeli newspaper before achieving eternal life on the internet. Apparently, a bystander dug my scrap of paper out of the wall after we left, a reminder of the price that came with stepping into the world stage. The line between my private and public lives was dissolving. Each thought and gesture was now a matter of global interest. Get used to it, I told myself. It's part of the deal. Returning from my overseas trip, I felt like an astronaut or an explorer just back from an other's expedition, charged with adrenaline and vaguely disoriented by ordinary life. With only a month to go before the Democratic National Convention, I decided to try to normalize things a little by taking my family to Hawaii for a week. I told Ploof the matter wasn't up for debate. After campaigning for 17 months, I needed to recharge, and so did Michelle. Also, Truth's health was deteriorating rapidly, and while we couldn't know exactly how long my grandmother might have, I didn't intend to make, repeat the mistake I had made with my mother. Most of all, I wanted some time with my daughters. As far as I could tell, the campaign hadn't affected our bonds. Malia was as chatty and inquisitive with me as ever, Sasha as buoyant and affectionate. When I was on the road, I talked to them by phone every night about school, their friends, and the latest SpongeBob episode. When I was home, I read to them, challenged them to board games, and occasionally snuck out with them for ice cream. Still, I could see from week to week how fast they were growing, how their limbs always seemed an inch or two longer than I remembered, their conversations at dinner more sophisticated. These changes served as a measure of all that I had missed, the fact that I hadn't been there to nurse them when they were sick, or hug them when they were scared, or laugh at the jokes they told. As much as I believed in the importance of what I was doing, I knew I wouldn't ever get the time back, and often found myself questioning the wisdom of the trade. I was right to feel guilty. It's hard to overstate the burden I placed on my family during those two years I ran for president. How much I relied on Michelle's fortitude and parenting skills, and how much I depended on my daughter's natural good cheer and maturity. Earlier that summer, Michelle had agreed to bring the girls and join me as I campaigned in Butte, Montana, on the 4th of July, which just happened to be Malia's 10th birthday. My sister Maya and her family decided to come as well. We had our share of fun that day, visiting a mining museum and squatting one another with water guns, but much of my time was still devoted to vote getting. The girls charged dutifully beside me as I shook hands along the town's parade route. They stood in the heat watching me speak at an afternoon rally. In the evening, after the fireworks I had promised were cancelled due to thunderstorms, we held an impromptu birthday party in a windowless conference room on the lower level of the local holiday inn. Our advanced staff had done its best to liven up the place with a few balloons. There was pizza and salad and a cake from the local supermarket. Still, as I watched Malia blow out the scandals, 
and make her wish for the year ahead. I wondered whether she was disappointed, whether she might look back later on this day as proof of her dad's misplaced priorities. Just then, Christian Jarvis, one of Michelle's young aides, pulled out an iPod and hooked it up to a portable speaker. Malia and Sasha grabbed my hands to pull me out of my chair. Pretty soon everyone was dancing to Beyonce and the Jonas Brothers, Sasha's gyrating, Malia shaking her short curls, Michelle and Maya letting loose as I showed off my best dad moves. After half hour an hour, all of us happily out of breath, Malia came over and sat on my lap. Daddy, she said, this was the best birthday ever. I kissed the top of her head and held her tight, not letting her see my eyes get misty. Those are my daughters. That's what I had given up by being away so much. That's why the days we stole in Hawaii that August were worth it. Even if we lost some ground against McCain in the polls, splashing in the ocean with the girls, letting them bury me in sand without having to tell them I had to get on a conference call or leave for the airport. It was worth it, watching the sun go down over the Pacific with my arms wrapped around Michelle, just listening to the wind and rustling palms, worth it. Seeing two times over her living room couch, barely able to raise her head but still smiling with quiet satisfaction as her great-granddaughter slapped and played on the floor, and then feeling her mottled, blue-veined hand squeeze mine for perhaps the last time, a precious sacrament. I couldn't leave the campaign entirely behind while still in Hawaii. There were updates from the team, thank you calls to support us, a preliminary outline on my convention speech that I drafted and sent to Favs. And there was a single most consequential decision I had to make now that I was the nominee. Who would be my running mate? I had narrowed it down to Governor Tim Kaine of Virginia and Senate colleague Joe Biden of Delaware. At the time, I was much closer to Tim, who had been the first prominent elected official outside of Illinois to endorse me for president and had worked as one of the top campaign surrogates. Our friendship came easily. We were roughly the same age, had similar Midwestern roots, similar temperaments, and even similar resumes. Tim had worked on a mission in Honduras while a student at Harvard Law School and had practiced civil rights law before joining politics. As for Joe, we couldn't have been more different, at least on paper. He was 19 years my senior. I was running as the Washington outsider. Joe had spent 35 years in the Senate, including stints as chairman of the Judiciary Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee. In contrast to my peripatetic upbringing, Joe had deep roots in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and took pride in his working class Irish heritage. It was only years later after you were elected that we discovered our respective Irish forebears. Both bootmakers had left Ireland for America just five weeks apart. And if I was seen as temperamentally cool and collected, measured in how I used my words, Joe was all warmth, a man without inhibitions, happy to share whatever popped into his head. It was an endearing treat for he genuinely enjoyed people. You could see it as he walked in a room, his handsome face always cast in a dazzling smile, and just in chase from whomever I was talking to, asking a person where they were from, telling them a story about how much he loved their hometown, best calzone I ever tasted, or how they must know so and so, an absolutely great guy, salt of the earth, flattering their children, anyone could tell you are gorgeous. Or their mother you can't be a day over 40 and then on the next person and the next until he had touched every soul in the room with a flurry of handshakes hugs kisses back slaps compliments and one-liners joe's enthusiasm had its downside in a town filled with people who liked to hear themselves talk he had no peer in a speech he was scheduled for 15 minutes joe went for at least an half an hour it was scheduled for a half an hour, then there was no telling how long he might talk. His soliloquies during committee hearings were legendary. His lack of a filter periodically got him in trouble, as when during the primaries he had pronounced me articulate and bright and clean and a nice looking guy, a phrase surely meant as a compliment, but interpreted by some as suggestion that characteristics in a black man were noteworthy. As I came to know Joe, though, I found his occasional gaps to be trivial compared to his strengths. On domestic issues, he was smart, practical, and did his homework. 
His experience in foreign policy was broad and deep. During his relatively short-lived run in the primaries, he had impressed me with his skill and discipline as a debater and his comfort on the national stage. Most of all, Joe had heart. He had overcome a bad stutter as a child, which probably explained his vigorous attachment to words and two brain aneurysms in middle age. In politics, he had known early success and suffered embarrassing defeats, and he had endured an imaginable tragedy. In 1972, just weeks after Joe was elected to Senate, his wife and baby daughter had been killed, and his two young sons, Bo and Hunter, injured in a car accident. In the wake of his loss, his colleagues and siblings had to talk him out of quitting the Senate, but he had arranged his schedule to make a daily hour and a half Amtrak commute between Delaware and Washington to care for his boys, a practice he had continued for the next three decades. That Joe had survived such heartbreak was a credit to his second, second wife, Jill, a lovely and understated teacher whom he had met three years after the accident and who raised Joe's sons as her own. Anytime you saw the Bidens together, it was immediately obvious how much his family sustained Joe, how much pride and joy he took in both then Delaware's Attorney General and a rising star in state politics, in Hunter, a lawyer in DC, in Ashley, a social worker in Willing Wilmington, and in their beautiful grandkids. Family had sustained Joe, but so too had a buoyancy of character. Tragedy and setbacks may have scarred him, I would learn, but they hadn't made him bitter or cynical. It was on the basis of those impressions that I had asked Joe to undergo the initial voting process and meet me while I was campaigning in Minnesota. He was resistant at first. Like most senators, Joe had a healthy ego and disliked the idea of playing second fiddle. Our meeting began with him explaining all the reasons why the job of vice president might be a step down for him, along with an explanation of why he would be the best choice. I assured him that I was looking not only for a ceremonial stand-in, but for a partner. If you pick me, Joe said, I want to be able to give you my best judgment and frank advice. You'll be the president and I'll defend whatever you decide, but I want to be the last guy in the room on every major decision. I told him that was a commitment I could make. Both acts and proved that the world of Tim Kaine, unlike me, they knew he would fit seamlessly into the Obama administration. But also like me, they wondered whether putting two relatively young, inexperienced and liberal civil rights attorneys on a ticket might be more hope and change than the voters could handle. Joe carried his own risk. He figured his lack of discipline in front of a microphone might result in unnecessary controversies. His style was old school, he liked the limelight, and he wasn't always self-aware. I sensed that he could get prickly if he thought he wasn't given his due a quality that might flare up when dealing with a much younger boss, and yet I found this contrast between us compelling. I liked the fact that Joe was more than ready to serve as president if something happened to me, and that it might reassure those who is still worried I was too young. His foreign policy experience would be valuable during a time when we were embroiled in two wars, so would his relationships in Congress and his potential to reach voters still wary of electing African-American president. What mattered most, though, was my gut told me that Joe was decent, honest, and loyal. I believed that he cared about ordinary people and that when things got tough, I could trust him. I wouldn't be disappointed. How the Democratic National Convention in Denver got put together is largely a mystery to me. I was consulted on the order of the program over the four nights it would take place, the themes that would be developed, the speakers scheduled. I was shown biographically videos for approval and asked for a list of families and friends who would need accommodi accommodations. Proof checked in to see if I was game to hold the convention's final night, not in a traditional indoor arena, but at the Mealy High Stadium, home of the Denver Broncos. With a capacity of close to 8,000, it could accommodate the ten of thousands of volunteers from across the country who had been the foundation of a campaign. It also had no roof, which meant we'd be exposed to the elements. What if it rains? I asked. 
We pulled 100 years worth of weather reports for Denver on August 28th at 8 p.m. Gloof said, it only rained once. What if this year is the second time? Do we have a backup plan? Once we locked in the stadium, Gloof said, there's no going back. He gave me a slight money call, Brian. Remember, we are always at our best without a net. Why stop now? Why indeed? Michelle and the girls traveled to Denver a couple of days ahead of me while I campaigned in a few states. So by the time I arrived, the festivities were in full swing. swing. Satellite trucks and press tents surrounded the arena like an army laying siege. Street vendors hawked t shirts, hat, Twitter bags, and jewelry adorned with our Rising Sun logo or my jagged eared visage. Tourists and paparazzi clicked away at the politicians and occasional celebrities wandering the arena. Unlike the 2000 convention when I'd been the kid pressing his face against the candy store window or the 204 convention when my keynote had placed me at the center of the spectacle, I now found myself both at the staring attraction and on the periphery trapped in a hotel suite or looking out the window of my secret service vehicle arriving in Denver only the second to last night of the convention. It was a matter of security, I was told, as well as deliberate stagecraft. If I remained out of sight, anticipation would only build, but it made me feel restless and oddly removed, as if I were merely an expensive prop to be taken out of the box under special conditions. Certain moments from the week do stand out in my mind. I remember Mali and Sasha and three of Joe's granddaughters rolling around on a pile of air mattresses in our, in our hotel suits, all of them giggling, lost in their secret games and wholly indifferent to the holler below. I remember Hillary stepping up to the microphone representing the New York delegates and formally making the motion to vote me in as the Democratic nom nominee, a powerful gesture of unity. And I remember sitting in the living room of a very sweet family of supporters in Missouri, making small talk and munching on snacks before Michelle appeared on the television screen, luminescent in an aquarium dre dress to deliver the convention's opening night address. I had deliberately avoided reading Michelle's speech beforehand, not wanting to meddle in the process or add to the pressure. Having seen her on the campaign trail, I had no doubt she'd be good, but listening to Michelle tell her story that night, seeing her talk about her mom and dad, the sacrifices they made and the values they passed on, hearing her trace her and likely journey and describing her hope for her daughters, having this woman who had shouldered so much watch for the fact that I'd always being true to my family and to my convictions, seeing the convention hall audience, the network anchors, and the people sitting next to me transfixed. Well, I couldn't have been more prouder. Contrary to what some commentators said at the time, my wife didn't find her voice that night. A national audience finally had a chance to hear that voice unfiltered. But eight hours later, I found myself holed up with valves and axe in a hotel room, fine-tuning the acceptance speech I delivered the following evening. It had been tough to write. We felt the moment called for more prose than poetry. With a hard-hitting critique of Republican policies and an account of specific steps I intended to take as president, all without being too long to dry our too partisan, it had required countless revisions and I had little time to practice as I stood behind a mock podium delivering my lines that Moswe was more workman-like than inspired. Only once did the full meaning of my nomination hit me. By coincidence, the last night of the convention fell on the 45th anniversary of the march on Washington and Dr. King's historic I Have a Dream speech. We had deceived, decided not to draw too much attention. To the fact, figuring that it was a poor idea to invite comparisons to one of the greatest speech in American's history. But I did pay tribute to the miracle of the young preacher from Georgia in the closing bars of my speech, putting something he'd said to the people who'd gathered on the National Mall that day in 1963. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall walk always march ahead. We cannot turn back. We cannot walk alone. I hadn't remembered these particular lines from Dr. King's speech, 
but as I read them aloud during practice, I found myself thinking about all the older black volunteers I'd met in our office around the country, the way they clench my hand and tell me they never thought they'd see the day when a black man would have a real chance to be president. I thought about the seniors who wrote to me to explain how they had woken up and been the first in line to vote during the primaries, even though they were sick or disabled. I thought about the doorman, janitor, secretaries, clerks, dishwashers, and dear drivers. I encountered any time I passed through hotel, halls, conferences, centers, or even office buildings, how they'd wave or give me a thumbs up or shyly accept a handshake. Black men and women of a certain age who, who like Michelle's parents, had quietly done what was necessary to feed their families and send their kids to school, and now recognized in me some of the fruits of their labor. I thought of all the people who had sat in jail or joined the march on Washington 40, 50 years ago and wondered how they would feel. Then I walked out onto that stage in Denver, how much they had seen their country transformed and how far things still were from what they had hoped. You know what? Give me a second. I said, my voice catching in the throat, my eyes starting to brim. I went to the bathroom to splash some water on my face. When I returned a few minutes later, father's axe and the Tem- teleprompter operator were all quiet and sure of what I have to do. Sorry about that, I said. Let's try it again from the top. I had no doubt getting through the speech the second time around. The only interruptions came about halfway through my orientation when we had a knock on the door and I found a hotel server with a Caesar salad standing in the hall. What can I say? Ak said with a sheepish grin, I was starving, and by the following evening, as I walked onto the broad, blue-carpeted stage and a clear and opening sky to address a stadium full of people and million more across the country, all that I felt was calm. The night was warm, the roar from the crowd infectious, the flashes of thousands of cameras mirroring the star overhead. When I was finished speaking, Michelle and the girls in the then Joe and Jilly Biden joined me to wave through a flurry of confetti. And across the stadium, we could see people laughing and hugging, waving flags to beat of a song by country artist Brooks and Dunn that had become a staple on the com- campaign trail only in America. Historically, a presidential candidate enjoys a healthy bounce in the polls after a successful convention. By all accounts, ours had been close to flawless. Our pollsters reported that after Denver, my lead over John McCain had indeed widened to at least five points. It lasted about a week. John McCain's campaign had been flailing, despite the fact that he had wrapped up the Republican nomination three months before I had secured mine. He had not achieved much in the way of momentum. Swing voters remained unpersuaded by his proposal for further tax cuts on the top of those Bush had already passed. In the new, more polarized climate, McCain himself appeared hesitant to even mention issues like immigration reform and climate change, which had previously banished his reputation as a maverick inside his party. In fairness, he had been dealt a bad hand. The Iraq war remained as unpopular as ever. The economy already in recession was rapidly worsening and so were Bush approval numbers. In an election likely to hinge on the promise of change, McCain looked and sounded more of the same. McCain and his team must have known they needed to do something dramatic, and I have to give them credit, they sure did deliver. That day after our convention ended, Michelle and I, along with Jill and Joe Biden, were on the campaign plane waiting to take off for a few days of events in Pennsylvania when Axe rushed up to tell us that word had leaked of McCain's running mate. Joe looked at the name on Axe Blackberry and then turned to me. Who the hell is Sarah Palin? He said. For the next two weeks, national press corps would obsess over the fact question, giving McCain's campaign a much needed shot of adrenaline and effectively knocking our campaign off the airwaves. After adding Palin to the ticket, McCain raked in millions of dollars in fresh donations in a single weekend. His poll numbers leapt up, essentially putting us in a dead heat. Sarah Palin, the 44-year-old governor of Alaska and an unknown when it came to national politics, was above all a potent disruptor. Not only was she young and a woman, a potential groundbreaker in her own right, 
but she also had a story you couldn't make up. She had been a small town basketball player and a pageant queen who had bounced among five colleges before graduating with a journalism degree. She had worked for a while as a sportscaster before getting elected mayor of Wasilla, Alaska, and then taking on the state's entrenched Republican establishment and beating the incumbent governor in 2006. She had married her high school sweetheart, had five kids including a teenage son about to be deployed to Iraq and a baby with Down syndrome, professed a conservative Christian faith, and enjoyed hunting moose and elk during her spare time. Hers was a biography tailor made for working class white voters who hated Washington and harbored the not entirely unjustified suspicion that big city elites, whether in business, politics, or the media, looked down on their way of life. In the New York Times editorial board of or NPR listeners questioned her qualifications. Pauline didn't care. She offered their criticism as proof of her authenticity, understanding far earlier than many of her critics that the old gatekeepers were losing relevance, that the walls of what was considered acceptable in a candidate for national office had been breached, and that Fox News, talk radio, and the other budding power of social media could provide her with all the platforms she needed to reach her intended audience. It helped too that Pauline was a born performer. Her 45 minute speech at the Republican National Convention in early September was a masterpiece of folksy populism and well aimed zingers. In small towns, we don't know what to make of a candidate who lavishes praise on working people when they are listening and then talks about how bitterly they cling to their religion and guns when those people aren't listening. Ouch! The delegates were ecstatic. Touring with Palino after the convention, McCain spoke to crowds three or four times larger than when he normally saw on his own, and while the Republican faithful cheered politely during his speeches, it became clear that it was his hockey mom running mates they were really there to see. She was new, different, and one of them, a real American, and fantastically proud of it. In a different time and different place, say, a swing state senator or gubernatorial race, the sheer energy Palin generated within the Republican base might have been had me worried, but from the day McCain chose her and thought through the heights of Palin mania, I felt certain the decision would not serve him well. For all of Palin's performative gifts, our vice president's most important qualification was the ability, if necessary, to assume presidency. Given John's age and history of melanoma, that wasn't an idle concern. And what became abundantly clear as soon as Sarah Palin stepped into the spotlight was on the about every subject relevant to governing the country, she had absolutely no idea what the hell she was talking about. The financial system, the Supreme Court, the Russian invasion of Georgia. It didn't matter what the topic was or what form question took. The Alaskan governor appeared lost, stringing words together like a kid trying to bluff her way through a test for which she had failed to study. Berlin's nomination was troubling on a deeper level. I noticed from the start that her incoherence didn't matter to the vast majority of Republicans. In fact, in time she crumbled under questioning by journalists, she, they seemed to view it as proof of liberal conspiracy. I was even more surprised to witness prominent conservatives, including those who spent a year dismissing me as inexperienced and who spent decades declaring affirmative action. The erosion of intellectual standards and the debasement of Western culture and the hands of multiculturalists. Suddenly shilling for Berlin, tying themselves into knots as they sought to convince the public that in a vice presidential candidate, the need for basic knowledge of foreign policy or the functions of the federal government was actually overrated. Sarah Palin, the Cregan, had good instincts, they said, and once installed, she would grow into the job. It was of course a sign of things to come, a larger darker reality in which partisan affiliation and political expedience would threaten to blot out everything, your previous positions, your stated principles, even what your own senses, your own eyes and ears told you to be true. The end. Chapter 8